Okay, so we know what a project is, a temporary, complex, unique initiative. So with that, our initiation phase is complete. And the project manager is the one with the skills and experience to make the project happen. But hold on a minute, our Lamborari project hasn't got a PM. Who could take on such an important task? How about... you? Excellent. Welcome aboard. So, now, we're at the point where the board of directors has okayed the project, the PM has been hired along with the project team, the feasibility study and risk assessment have been carried out, we have a neat project charter, and everything looks in order. So what next? Time to plan a project. So, take a pencil, Grab the scrunched up napkin from the dinner table and spend the next five minutes drawing a mind map. <laughs> oh, if only it were that simple. Planning is a detailed procedure and is the key ingredient in the recipe for success. In this next section, we'll take a trip through the ins and outs of the planning process. Let's begin with the simplest of questions. What is planning? It is the process of analysing, evaluating, deciding and organising activities in advance. We can summarise it in three fundamental steps. 1. Define the goal. 2. Evaluate options. And 3. Choose and confirm the best option to achieve the goal. Complex human endeavours involve planning on two levels. Strategic, should we do it? And tactical. How do we do it? When and what resources should we spend? But how important is planning in our work and in our spare time? That's an excellent question. So consider the following examples. Sports managers. They do not simply show up to the game and start yelling at the players. Before the game, they analyse multiple aspects. Create a game plan decide how to attack the opponent's weak spots, how to defend their own, and they also have backup plans if the initial ones don't work. Take Hollywood actors. They have a strict diet and exercise plan in order to get buffed out enough to convincingly play your favourite superhero. These plans involve expensive physical trainers and dietitians who regiment their entire day-to-day -day lives. Or maybe something as simple as shopping. Before we go shopping, we look through our covers to see what we need, and we make a list, usually. When we don't, we come home having spent triple our usual amount, both of time and money. Nothing we bought can be combined to make a legitimate meal, so we end up ordering a pizza. Okay, this last one is failing to plan well on a small scale. But did you know the Sydney Opera House was initially planned to take six years to build for $7 million, while in reality it took 16 years to build and cost $106 million? Something must have been missed during the risk assessment or when evaluating the scope, right? Or how about the 2016 Oscar fiasco, where lack of proper controls ended up with the wrong best picture being announced? More than just money and time was lost there. With that said, what are the conclusions you can draw from these examples? Let me help spell it out for you. Planning is an enormous part of our personal and business lives, and failure to plan properly can have disastrous results. On the other hand, excel at planning and you or your company will reap the rewards. Let's wrap it up here, everyone. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next lesson. Planning projects is the fundamental work of the project manager. It's their time to shine. The planning stage is where the project manager creates the most value and demonstrates their expertise. They must plan all components of the project, that's the planning breadth, to a sufficient level of detail which we call the planning depth. Generally speaking, we can say there are two main areas to address when doing this. Things the project manager knows and can control, 
and things the project manager doesn't know and cannot control. When planning the details they are knowledgeable of, the project manager creates to-do lists, orders the items in a way that is most efficient and assigns the best people to the appropriate tasks. Then, there are the things the project manager doesn't know and can't control. Here, the project manager needs to think creatively. Risk assessment, estimations and forecasts are part of this process and the project manager is responsible for eliminating or decreasing bad influences on the project. How do they do that? Through diligent planning. Any risks that are unknown, say what the weather will be like next autumn, cannot be factored a year in advance, but the project manager will be prepared for any weather, among other things. As you can tell, good planning is a wondrous opportunity to optimize the work, ensure that everyone's expectations are the same and avoid costly errors. The future always contains uncertainties, so the more planning, the better, right? Right. The more things the project manager plans for, the higher their chances are to complete the project successfully, in that they meet the goal, the timelines, and the budget. And let's not forget to mention the people. People work so much better with direction when they understand what to do and how and when to do it. I can't stress this enough. Planning is your strategy to succeed. The reason we are drilling this message so hard is that planning is often criminally underestimated. People think the sooner they move to execution, the better. But that's just not the case. In terms of project manager effort, it is often the other way around. Think of it as the 80-20 rule. If more effort is expended in the planning phase, less is needed during the execution. Less planning gaps means less replanning and reorganization, which can lead to delays. The misconception is understandable though. We as humans can be impatient. We get excited to reach the end goal and we feel like we need to be doing something in order to be productive. When really, in project management, planning is the most productive we can be, if done properly. So, let's see in the next lesson how bad planning can affect a project. See you there. To really drum in the importance of planning, in case you haven't been listening, this lesson is going to look at the cost of change. Let's take this back to our project and jump into your project manager's shoes. Say you've planned for our showroom to be finished by the end of August, but when July comes around, Lamborari decide they want to add an additional floor. It's clear that construction won't be complete now until at least October, maybe longer due to bad autumn weather. The additional budget, time, resources and coordination efforts that are required to adjust for the change are the cost. Remember our trio of constraints? If one change occurs and affects one of our constraints, they will all be affected. And what's more, when the change is needed makes a great difference. If a change occurs later in the project, you can safely bet your holiday savings fund that the impact will be much worse than if it had happened at an earlier stage. If this decision had been made earlier, before construction had started and the weather was better, the cost would be much lower. Take a look at the following graph. As the time passes and the project progresses from initiation through planning and execution, the cost of change increases. Simple enough. But in case you're not much of a graph person, let's look at an example too. Imagine a project where a company aims to start making yo-yos that double as Bluetooth speakers. Then at some point, top management decides that yo-yos aren't cool anymore and wants to make Diablos instead. If this decision is made early in the project, you can imagine the impact will not be too devastating. 
But think if this happened after all the yo-yo making machines had been bought. There's a good chance the project wouldn't even survive a change like that. You can imagine that expectations of stakeholders and scope are very important during the planning stage. And if the project manager doesn't cover everything in their plan, then things can go very wrong. That's why a project manager will need to plan their plan. Yes, that's right. See you next lesson where we'll show you how and why. I know it sounds silly, but planning your plan is what makes the difference between a productive plan and that napkin mind map I mentioned a few lessons ago. Planning your planning does take a fair amount of time and effort. There are plenty of things for a project manager to think about. First, the project manager must assess their own knowledge of the required work. Is it enough for a sufficient plan? Second, do they know all the stakeholders? If not, they need to get in touch and discuss what their involvement will be in the project. What will they be expected to do? For example, the project manager can't plan who will pay the construction team if they don't know who the financial team is. Third, they must recall lessons learned. No need to reinvent the wheel, right? Have they or any of their team worked on a similar project? And if so, what lessons have they learned that they can bring across to the current project? Lastly, what about any knowledge gaps? Are there any expertise that the project manager lacks? Do they need to bring in extra support for any areas of planning? A good project manager is not someone who knows everything, but somebody who can see their shortcomings and find the right people to compensate for them. The project manager needs to determine how much time they need to put all the pieces of the project plan together. They will decide who they need to keep in contact with and if they need to reaffirm expectations. Reviewing the four points above will definitely help with that task. And in the case of meetings and workshops with stakeholders, they must make sure they have a clear agenda, a distinct goal, and a comprehensive list of topics to ensure they get the answers they need with as little resistance as possible. See, project managers really do have to think of everything. That's why the next lesson is going to be all about planning your plans plan. Just kidding. We're going to take a short interlude to explain a couple of planning tidbits that will be useful to know. See you there. Before we move on to planning, I just want to interject with a couple of pointers that are worth knowing, because we've got your back. The first one is a tip from PMI, so you know it's worth your time. Here it is. Planning is iterative. We've made it clear that planning covers all sections of the project, from timelines to risks to expectations. But it's important to know that before the planning is complete, you may often need to make modifications to the stages already planned. New information can always change the plans you've already made. For example, say you're planning timelines for the virtual reality area of your showroom. Last year, you added a section like this to a different showroom and it took you two months. Therefore, when you plan this in your timeline, you use the same duration. A little while later, you start planning your resources and you realize that two members of the tech team have left since last year, leaving you with 20% less staff there's a good chance this will affect your timelines and you will have to go back and revise them, adjusting the time and resources of the project. See, planning is iterative. Be patient and until all areas have been analysed and planned, you better write your plans in pencil. Then we have what we call non-straightforward tasks. Some tasks are simple. We can imagine how they will be done and in how much time. Say one task is organize a workshop session. The project manager reviews the necessary participants, finds a good day and time for everyone's calendars, books a room, puts a flip chart inside and sends the invitations. This process is easy to predict and execute, right? 
There are, however, these non-straightforward tasks. In our project, let's say you are planning to project dynamic elements and animations on the cars, things like weather and different paint jobs. For this to work, you need to recruit an experienced software developer. Let's call this task Estimate Recruitment Duration. Sounds simple, right? You need to analyse and dedicate a number of weeks to recruit the person. You decide that two days are more than enough time to get the information needed to estimate this. So you write an email to HR and ask how many weeks they'll need to recruit an appropriate engineer. The same afternoon, you see a reply from HR. Excellent. Looks like you'll have to estimate in one day instead of two. You open the email and it says they can't give you an estimate until you tell them more about the ideal candidate. How many years of experience? What kind of projects have they worked on? What kind of programming language is needed? Things like that. You stare blankly at your computer screen because you have no idea. The next day, you call your colleague in the IT department and ask them for the details HR needs. They respond quickly with most of the information, but recommend you get formal validation from Sandra, head of IT. But Sandra is on holiday for the next two days. You have no choice but to wait. When Sandra returns, she's happy to help, but needs a day to go through the information and validate it. Finally, the following day, you get the information and send it over to HR. They review it and give you an estimate of seven weeks. Awesome. Task completed. Although instead of two days, it took you eight days to estimate recruitment duration and fit it into your plan. Tasks like this, especially ones which involve other people and information the project manager is not fully knowledgeable in, can have unexpected results and complicate the process, which in turn can change plans. Keep this in mind as we move on to the next lesson and the real planning. It's all been coming down to this. Brace yourselves and see you in the next lesson. Welcome. Are you ready to see how a project manager plans a project? Excellent. Over the next few lessons, we're going to discuss every step of the process. And by the end, you will be more than aware how essential the planning stage is in the project life cycle. At this point, the project manager should have what they need to begin planning. And this stage, the planning, has its own structure. So the project manager can cover all areas. Because as we know, the more thorough the plan, the less likely the project manager will end up needing to spend resources fixing something later in the project. Breadth and depth, remember? So where do we start? That's right, scope. The project manager needs to know exactly what her or his project will involve before any work starts. Sensible, right? Thinking of our Lamborari project, in order to prepare what you need to build the showroom, and for it to be a trendy new building setting the standard for all other car showrooms, you need to know exactly what this project will involve. What should the showroom building look like? How many floors? What cars are you producing? What colour scheme will you go for? Which angle will the building face? This is why scope is the first thing you have to plan. You are accountable for translating the goal of the project into deliverables and then into tasks, or sets of tasks. Collectively, these represent the scope, and the scope answers one question and one question only. What exactly does the project team need to do? I never said it was an easy question. So our goal is to have a new top-of-the-range showroom in a new retail park showcasing our newest, most state-of-the-art cars with well-trained staff and setting the standard in terms of showroom architecture. Deliverables are the building blocks of the project. They all come together to reach the goal. One deliverable is construction of the showroom. And the set of tasks needed to reach this deliverable are the following. 1. 
lay the foundation. 2. Erect the walls and core structure. 3. Fit the floor. And 4. Paint the outside. And that is just one part of the scope. Remember, the scope is the broader concept. It's not just the product, or in our example, the cars, the showroom, and staff themselves. It includes all the additional work that needs to be done to ensure the product is not only created, but meets the requirements and expectations of the project stakeholders. Now, what if you find out there's a building already on the piece of land that you want to build the showroom on? You'll have to demolish it. This is not part of the construction deliverable, but needs to be done before anything else can start. Therefore, it's part of the scope. If this had not been thought of, construction would be delayed, costs would be above what had been planned, and stakeholders' expectations would not be met. So, you will need to think of the product scope. That is, the tasks that need to be done in order to produce the product. The showroom, in our case. Also, you will need to think of the project scope, which is all that you need to do in order to achieve the project goal including the product scope. Say there is a small street next to where the showroom is to be built, and the residents on that street are of the clear opinion that it is the responsibility of the company that is building the showroom to renovate the street. Is that a responsibility of the company? The answer is in the scope statement of the project. If it's not specifically included, you cannot spend resources on this costly work. This is why scope needs to be described in detail, including what is not in the scope. Of course, a little common sense goes a long way here. If you forgot to put door handles in your showroom project scope, but included windows and doors, we would not deny the showroom 20 or so door handles. However, a few million dollars on a brand new road that hasn't even been signed off by the city, well... That's just bad planning. Of course, this is something that must be agreed between the construction company and the city when the construction rights are being signed, which is part of the initiation task. If there is an agreement for partnership and the company needs to work on the street, this must be formally added to the scope so you can assign the relevant resources. Now, To sum up the scope stage, the project manager starts by assessing the information she or he has on the project's scope, being what they gained during the initiation. Then, they gather detailed information on the requirements and expectations in the project. They use their expertise and that of their team members to cover all the grey areas of the scope that can and will affect their project. And finally, they document everything. If something arises, there needs to be an easy reference point for the project manager or other stakeholders to check in order to determine if something is worthy of their time and resources. Awesome. In the next lesson, we will look at these three steps in more detail. How a project manager analyzes the high-level information, deals with stakeholder expectations, and how they document the scope in a user-friendly way. See you there. Hi. I'm sure you remember last lesson, but just in case, let's recap the logical process of scope planning. First, we analyse the available information on the project scope. Then, we gather detailed requirements and expectations. And finally, we document the scope. Simple enough. But now we're going to have a low-level look at this process. So the first step. The project manager analyzes the high-level information from the project goal and scope, gained from the initiation stage. These come from sources like the project charter, discussions with the sponsor, client and stakeholders, and other project communications. The next step is for the project manager to gather detailed requirements and expectations. This stage involves dealing with the stakeholders, the ones who started and approved the project, 
sponsors and senior managers usually. And of course the ones who benefit from or are impacted by the project, such as external parties and departments within the organisation. They are a reliable source of information on scope if the project manager asks the right questions. The meetings and workshops the project manager planned are utilised here. Remember, getting this information can be difficult as these tasks are often non-straightforward tasks. This is where a project manager's personal skills and persistence are essential. Throughout this task, a project manager may find discrepancies in the expectations of different stakeholders. For example, a senior manager for Lamborari wants the sales team to have a new computer software to aid their daily work, so expects this enhancement to be part of the scope. The goal of the project is to improve the sales, right? However, new software for the sales department is not part of the scope here. Time and budget to do that are not forecasted. And from the triple constraint, you know what implications that will have. The project manager needs to adjust the senior manager's expectations to avoid wrongly expanding the scope. The pressure is on. The more experienced a project manager, the more detailed the scope will be. Of course, things will be missed and mistakes made, but the fewer, the better. And the more information a project manager gets out of the stakeholders, then the less likely big mistakes will occur. Once the scope is as detailed as it can be, the final step is for the project manager to officially document it using a scope statement. A sample is in the resources for this lesson. Although usually the project management office uses a standard template. Think of the scope statement as a formal contract between the project manager and other stakeholders. It can be used as proof of what the project manager has and hasn't committed to do. So, as explained, the purpose of the scope statement is to formalise the scope. Its format, however, is not user-friendly when it comes to the practical planning with timelines, actions and owners, which will follow. This is where the project manager needs to perform another exercise of structuring the scope. Create a work breakdown structure. In the breakdown structure, the project manager starts with the goal and breaks down the project work into deliverables or packages. This is called a work stream and it breaks down until the work package is an appropriate size to be given to one person. Then, for an even more user-friendly experience, they create a list with all these activities, an activity list, which details the person or people or department responsible for the task or activity, and they're referred to as the owner. Please note, we've just seen three documents that have the same information but are represented differently. Scope statement is formal. The work breakdown structure is a handy segregation of the different types of work or work streams. And the activity list is the skeleton of the project plan, the document everyone can refer to. But hold on, we haven't mentioned how long these tasks should take, which luckily is the basis for our next task, where we will detail the timelines and schedules of activities. Join us next lesson and together we'll go through how to do this. See you there.